Okay, I wanted to do a, a quick uh, sketchbook flip through. I actually, for the first time, made this sketchbook. I've never bound the sketchbook by myself before. Uh, so um, I think it turned out okay. There are some improvements that could be made. And once I get all the bugs worked out, I'll make a little video showing how to make your own sketchbook. Um, so I made the label. I made a little tag on the inside that shows that it's handmade. And this sketchbook has a theme. It really is uh, all related to some sort of nature. Uh, so what I did was choose an organism every day that I was interested in. I sketched it. And I also looked up some information about it so I could learn something about the particular organism. So I'll run through these, show you the sketches, and just uh, um, maybe tell you one or two uh, fun things to know and tell about each organism. Okay, the first organism that I sketched was the monarch butterfly, which is shown here. The butterfly lays its eggs on milkweed plants, and when the eggs finally hatch, they form caterpillars, and the caterpillars start eating the milkweed plant right away. And in the leaves of the plant, are uh, there are lots of toxins which get concentrated in the caterpillar's body and it makes the caterpillar distasteful to birds. Eventually this caterpillar will, will surround itself in a chrysalis and undergo a metamorphosis to eventually um, produce new butterflies. And so that's the life cycle. The reason I got interested in the monarch butterfly was uh, because I was reading a book called Bicycling with Butterflies, where this young lady um, got on her bicycle in Mexico and followed one of the eastern migration routes of the butterfly. So it goes, she went all the way by herself on her bicycle all the way up to Canada. And then when she got there, she turned around and went all the way back, something like 10,000 miles. Uh, and along the way, she stopped at um, schools and gave little lectures about um, preserving the, the monarch butterfly and preserving habitats and so forth. Um, you can see that this migration takes several um, generations. So the butterflies that are starting out here and going all the way back to Mexico have never been there before, but somehow or they know where to go. Okay, the next organism is the uh, Joshua tree. Uh, these trees are found in the southwestern United States. There's a special um, national park called Joshua Tree National Park that helps preserve that species. Uh, the species depends on uh, the yucca moth for pollination. And so these things have co-evolved uh, uh, the moth and the tree depend on each other. They have a mutualistic relationship. Uh, the Joshua trees, even though they're sometimes called trees, are actually uh, not trees at all, but succulents. This just is a little map of Joshua Tree National Park that I visited a while back. I stayed in one of the campgrounds. It's a beautiful place. Uh, the trees are uh, thought to be threatened because of global warming, and it's one of the reasons. Um, they seem to be very sensitive to uh, increases in temperature. The next um, organism that I sketched in this book is the cocoa tree. And you can see that it forms these little pods and inside are uh, seeds. Initially the pods are green, but they eventually as they ripen turn yellow. Uh, so these pods are picked and then the seeds are taken out and they're laid out in trays like this and covered with banana leaves. And they stay there from five to eight days where they undergo fermentation. Um, and during that fermentation process, sugar is produced, which helps make them sweeter. And then eventually the, the seeds are ground up and heated and the heat releases fats and other compounds from the seeds, which is mixed with milk and sugar to make milk chocolate. 
Uh, this is a dragon fruit, and I've never had these before, but I was surprised to learn that they're actually derived from cacti. And this is a this is the actual plant here, and you can see the uh, dragon fruit coming off the, off the ends. And uh, it's actually the white part here that's that's eaten. It's uh, filled with seeds. This white pulp that you can eat all of it together, including the seeds. It's very popular in Southeast Asia. These are this is star fruit, um, and they call it that because when you cut the the fruit through its cross section, it gives you a star shape. Um, these plants contain an inhibitor of what's called cytochrome P450, which is a system in our liver that helps to metabolize drugs. So uh, the fruit actually contains an inhibitor of that so that it can influence the lifespan of certain prescription drugs that we take. And so some people that are on certain prescription drugs shouldn't eat the star fruit because it causes the drugs to hang around in their bodies for longer than it should. Okay, <clears throat> this is the Sororo cactus, which is found in the southwestern United States. Uh, it can grow upwards of 40 feet in height. Um, quite often you see these little holes in, in the cactus, which are drilled by various types of birds that one, once it's, they form, they, uh, the birds actually uh, live inside the little pockets. Uh, it doesn't harm the the cactus because the, a wall forms between the hole and the rest of the cactus. So it sort of scars over. Um, some of the cactus that you see out there have multiple arms like this one. Some of them only have one arm. The more arms the better because the only place flowers can form are at the ends of the arm. So a cactus that has lots of arms has a lot of capacity to produce flowers and therefore greater reproductive ability. Uh, this is nutmeg. Uh, nutmeg grows as little nuts that form on the plant. And inside, if you break them open, there's uh, a hard shell nut, which um, you can grind um, to produce nutmeg, which we use for seasoning. Uh, the red part of the nut is harvested for um, mace, which is another type of seasoning. Okay, the next plant was the vanilla plant. And these are um, found primarily in Mexico. Uh, there are large vanilla plantations there. And the the bee that actually pollinates this plant is nearly extinct, so all of them have to on these plantations have to be self have to be pollinated by hand. So that's a very labor intensive process. Uh, the plant produces these little pods, which we extract the vanilla from. Vanilla extract. Uh, this is papaya. Uh, papayas can either be male or female or hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites are uh, plants that have both male and female parts, but it's only the, the female plant that produces the, the fruit. And the fruit looks something like this. It's the orange pulp that you actually um, eat. You scrape out the seeds. Uh, the male and female trees have different flowers on them. Uh, the next plant was coffee, and coffee, you can see the plant produces these little, these little berries, we call cherries, and then inside of the cherry there's uh, the coffee bean. Uh, there are a number of different ways of processing coffee. The natural way involves hand-picking the, the cherries, sorting them, and then they're dried on racks in the sun for three to six weeks. And during that time, fermentation occurs, and that helps to sweeten the, the coffee beans. And finally, the um, the um, outer layer of the coffee bean is taken off mechanically, 
and then uh, it's, the coffee is ground, roasted, and we use it in our coffee to make coffee. This is tea. These are the flowers. Uh, this is the tea leaf. And we harvest the leaves, grind them up, and we make the drink with them. Uh, this is just a little sketch showing the Japanese tea ceremony, which is a very ancient process, a very important ritual in Japan. And it dates back to the 9th century. It's heavily influenced by Zen Buddhism. Uh, these are banana trees, and you can see the bunch of bananas hanging down here with the flowers. And even though we refer to them as trees, they're actually not what we think of as stem of, as trunks are actually stems. Um, the banana plants that we get in the store have little seeds in them, but the seeds are not functional. Uh, the bananas that we eat are triploid, which means they have three copies of every one of the chromosomes. You have to have an even number of each copy in order to produce productive seeds. So the only way you can make new banana plants from these is to take cuttings from the roots, bury those, and then they give rise to new banana plants. But those, those banana plants are genetically identical to the original parent. So there's no genetic variation, unfortunately. Uh, these are olives, shown here. Um, they are uh, primarily found in the Mediterranean area. Uh, Greece and, and Italy are probably the largest producer of olives. Uh, some of the trees there are extremely old, over 3,000 years. And I didn't know this. I never really knew what virgin olive oil was. But it's apparently oil that's been extracted from the olives by cold mechanical extractions rather than using solvents to extract the oils.